Uh, welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast, podcast number 49. Uh, I'm here with Stevie Poocher, but I'm also pleased to say that we have the newly crowned All-Ireland champion, Tyrone keeper, uh, Nal Morgan, with us. Uh, but before we speak to Nal, uh, just a quick thanks to our sponsors, Ripped, for supporting the podcast. Ripped's online platform provides coaches with everything they need to optimize athlete performance. Head over to their website for more info. Um, now, nah, thanks for thanks for coming on. We're we're at the Wednesday now. You must be feeling a wee bit tired from all those celebrations. I was looking on on Twitter there to see Mugsy. He he posted that I think you were in Mulligans last night in in Cookstown. I was going to ask you how, how do you feel now, and has the whole thing sunk in yet? Extremely tired. Yeah, uh, it's, it's. I don't think it has fully sunk. And I watched the match yesterday, and it was a. Uh, it was a bit surreal watching it back and realizing, you know, that it it actually happened. And it's funny, like because I suppose being a uh, an athlete and somebody who uh, probably analyzes his own performance, you're still looking back at it and thinking, "Ah, oh, missed that kick out, or that should have went there and stuff," you know. But then you then you realize, right, catch yourself on and and. Uh, enjoy the moment and you can always go back and analyse later at a later date like. uh, How many times have you watched the game back? Just once uh, it'll be watched back a number of times I'd say Monday in school the children will get a rerun of it and Tuesday in school the children will get a rerun of it Wednesday the night <laughs> <laughs> Well uh, according to the according to the Irish Times on the player ratings you scored the hash you were 9 out of 10 uh, just going through the game, you made an excellent save from Brad, Brian Walsh. You made yourself big for the penalty miss. You scored not three from place kicks. Your short kickouts, long kickouts were excellent. Your usage of the ball in open play was superb. We, we, we've calculated that you were directly involved in roughly 50% of Tyrone's scores. Um, so here, you must be a wee bit disappointed that your club mate, Dazzler McCurry, got RT man of the match. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, I'm delighted for Darren because uh, there's nobody that I've ever came across puts as much work into their football as Darren does. Like, you know, I know it's uh, it is probably cliche speaking like that, but that man is at the pitch every night of the week. Like, he lives for football. He doesn't drink. He doesn't put bad food in his body. Everything revolves around football. Like, and he really, really deserves it. He wasn't there in 2018. He decided to take a year out and maybe because he wasn't getting to play sort of the way that suited him and for him to come back this year and do what he's done. And, and started off with tough enough for him. He didn't get any game time in the first league game. Paul Donaghy, who was part of our club and left and went to Dungan and won a senior championship last year, he came in had 10 points the first day out. And, you know, a lot of people were maybe thinking that Darn was, Darn's game time was going to be limited. But, you know, he really showed, you know, at the end of the year that, and basically from the next game on that, you know, how good he is. And, you know, every every bit of recognition that Darn gets, he, he absolutely deserves. And, you know, Darn's got this, you know, the persona of the Dazzler, like that people look on and think that it's a, that he's a showman and stuff and he loves his nights out and he loves the crack. But he's he's so determined to achieve his dreams and um, he hasn't had Daisy at all, all the time. And he just, he deserves it so much. He certainly does. Um, now, just going back to the to the game against Kerry and Killarney earlier on the season, uh, you shipped six goals that day in the National League. Uh, looking back now, how much of a sort of I blessing in disguise was, was that game? Sorry to mention those six goals, by the way. <laughs> As I said, thanks, thanks for reminding me. Uh, <laughs> no, it was... <laughs> it was, uh, I said before, it was on a personal level, you know, probably the most embarrassing game I've ever had for Throne. Uh, we have had our hammers, like we got absolutely hammered by Galway last year. We've got hammered by uh, Kerry down Killarney before and we've shipped a number of goals. Um, but, you know, to concede six and probably, you know, I would directly sort of look at myself for at least three or four of them. Uh, and not only that, they absolutely dismantled our kickouts that day. We tried to work short kickouts and you know, it was just so ineffective in every way, shape and form. And I was so disappointed. Like, I remember just going back to the, the hotel and uh, we had a very, very brief meeting, just basically outlining what the story was for the rest of the day. And as I walked past Brian Duher, 
after the meeting, uh, I just apologised to him, and my eyes just filled with tears. I just had to walk on. It was that's how embarrassed I was. Like it was, it was absolutely uh, gotten. Uh, but thankfully, we, we bounced back from it, you know. And again, cliche as it is, we we learned so much from that game, probably more than if we had went down and only got bit by one or two points. Joe, that's, that's just something I want to ask now. There, now you see, you talked about you learned so much from that game, and this is something that probably I've, uh, you know, been 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 looking for in the past is trying to sort of hold positives even from defeat. And I suppose, you know, a lot of people, the old cliche, you probably learn more from defeat than you do from victory. I'm going to bring you back three years. Uh, and I know I, I chatted to you last year and on a Zoom with, with a club team and that. And we, we had a good chat about 2018 and the final against Dublin. And I went back in today and I sort of looked at that final and I just had a wee scan over it before I came on tonight to chat to you. You know, there was a large proportion. I think now there was 11 players involved in that final that were involved on Saturday. Uh, on the field or whatever and there's obviously a huge level of experience there and learning from 2018 but you personally and you were the first to admit to me as well that you had a bad day at the office that day probably you felt you were very hard on yourself in the first half you, you you talked about the relentless Dublin press and how difficult that was but surely now from a learning perspective like the difference in the two performances for, from yourself personally 2018 and Saturday night was was chalk and cheese I'm sure you're absolutely delighted about that and I'm sure you took massive learning curves from that did you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know we have spoken about it before, and I've spoke to others about it as well. That you know, in eighteen, I started off really well, started the final really well, and had a couple of kickouts, you know, to the sidelines and stuff that were just so accurate. And I sort of maybe thought, oh, this is going to be easy, and I took my off the ball for one kickout, caught the ground a bit, and it ended up in the penalty, and it, it swung the game. Um, and then the Dublin press after that, I didn't want to try any kickouts in really after it. I wanted to just get everything out and long, which was, you know, very, probably, I don't want to say immature me, but uh, maybe the inexperience of just playing the final. Like, like for example, the first kickout the other day, you know, doesn't cross the 20 metre line, I get blew up for a hot ball straight away and I'm thinking, here we go again. And then I would think, right, it's one kickout, I can get on with things and... Uh, then I was able to change things around. Whereas I think in 18, a lot of us played the occasion rather than just playing the match. And the fact that it was Dublin and this Dublin team was so good and, you know, they were going for, well, it was that the third in a row at that stage? And uh, I think we get, we, all, we all got caught up in that as well. And then being 5-1 up, which we hadn't spoke about, we, we had only talked about what would do if we were behind and what would do if it was a close game. And we were 5-1 up and sort of, nearly cruising in a way and we completely took our eye off what we had to do next and you know we we got caught for it and uh, the rest is history I suppose but it was great to turn around the other night for for us all everybody that was involved not only in the 18 final but for everybody who's this was the first final it was just amazing like Hmm. and now I was going to ask you uh, did you change your personal preparation um, for the final against Mayo in comparison to the 2018 one? Or did you just go and do the same thing in the, in the lead up to it? It was it was strange uh, because in the lead up to, even just thinking of this year, in the lead up to the Kerry game, we had discussed how we were just going to go along with the majority of the kickouts. We were just going to get out as far as we could, try and beat their press and get it up the pitch. Um, and that's kind of similar to the way we approached the 2018 final with Dublin. The aim was to get the ball up on top of Collie as much as possible. Um, whereas, you know, Fergal and Brian just came to me last week and said, right, this is on you. You play it as you see it. And it just gave me so much confidence that they were they were basically trusting me to, you know, play, play as I see. Ad hoc was the, was the term they used. And it was just... It just sort of give me that wee boost that I needed going into the final that you know what it what just go, go as you see it and you know there was times that there was maybe a kick out that was on short that I maybe should have done whenever I'm looking back at it but you know it was nice to be able to say right I don't need to force that it can go long we're under pressure here a wee bit or you know if I really did need the ball you know you, you knew that you, you could find something somewhere well, they reckon they reckon now that goalkeepers only peak in their mid thirties, like so you have a long way to go before you hit your peak, boy. 
Money a cub yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, but on a on a serious note, that's that's wild interesting, Joe. Like, and it's 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 class to hear that because even your first kick out, and I remember the All Ireland final last year, uh, where Cluxton clipped the ball and got blown up for something similar. But it's it's the maturity and the experience as well to come back from that, you know, and see that, and you know, and I think that that I think people talk about kick out strategies, Joe, and I, you'd probably be able to. Be, be, come in on this as well like people talk about kick out strategies even at club level because we're going to have club coaches watching this and looking for nuggets of information that they can pull out like but surely you need a goalkeeper that that has to see it now too like they have to play as you see like you have to like surely i know you can orchestrate a kick out and you can orchestrate movement but you need the man with the balls to actually set it down and execute for me like yeah like i'm i'm not i, I like to have a go-to kick out every now and again or something that you work say after a water break or you know after a goal or whatever but the the biggest thing for me is like I always said our boys if you move I'll hit you just give me just give me movement you know if you look back to you know Cluxton and his prime you know there was no way Dublin had any set routine it was if if you're retired it seemed to be for me watching them if you're retired you sort of stayed in the middle you left your you left the gaps to the wing somebody moved created another pocket of the space somebody moved into that space and it was nearly that the space was moving rather than the players, so that you were just constantly just wherever the gap was, you were moving towards it. And like Petey Hart's brilliant at it for us. Like he'll just come into me and say, "Right, see this kick out, just kick it to me, wherever I'm at, just kick it to me." And see even the confidence that gives in you. You know that mm. it got us out of trouble in the Cavan game near the end when we were down to fourteen men against Monaghan. He won a couple of them, and he won one against Monaghan that I actually miss hit. Uh, and it was short and it just about got outside the D and he won it he turned he went through two or three men and he went out the other side whereas if it had been anybody else they would probably end up blown up for too long and Monaghan get a score and you know it'd end up a one point game which which we know and uh, it's just great to have players that have the confidence in me to move and then you know they they know that if they move and they get to the gap that I'll hit them like mm-hmm. Um, just on the on the Kerry game, I know Kerry pressed you really hard, and sometimes you did go long uh, now, but you didn't really get a lot of joy from it. A lot of it sounded a luck too, isn't it? Where these breaks go, um, you know, it's 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 yeah. the break of the ball too. Uh, how much does that play into? Yeah, well, like we we got like all in well, the majority of the journalists and uh, experts that were analysing the game afterwards, basically. Like tore our kick out apart and said how it malfunctioned and how, you know, I got a lot of the blame for it. And I know uh, one, you know, top rated uh, ex manager, he sort of said that this is this is the problem with Nal Morgan. He is he can do some great things, but you know, to consistently go long whenever Trump won win the breaking ball, you know. But like we we watched back closely the video of, of the game, and there were so many breaks where we had, you know three men inside the carry men but the break has went beyond it you know and that's an area that we looked at you know if, if, if the ball's going to break from our kick out we need to dictate where the break goes rather than allowing our team to smash it outside of the zone um, and we're also getting there maybe a bit too quick and that's that's coming from maybe like we, we hadn't done massive amount of practice on the, on the long kick out uh, before the game but like every kick out went in the in the carry game, every kick out that I hit long for a change went exactly to where I wanted it to go. So I was coming away from the game thinking, you know what, I've had a good game there, mm-hmm. even though we didn't win many of the breaks. And I think that gave me the confidence too. And even Brian and Fergal came to me as well, told me like you've done exactly what we've asked there. This is not new. We need to tidy this up from an from an outfield persp- uh, perspective. But a lot of it does d- depend on that. But it, it's it's getting the right men under the break as well, and like you could send the ball down overloaded zone but if you've got two or three lads there that that aren't used to getting in for for breaking ball then it's a there's not much point in and having them there for the overload like you look at the likes of Keir McGeary and Connor Myler and Niall Sludden great under the breaking ball like they're the boys that I want to be targeting if if I can see they're all in the pocket and we have one midfielder I want to be targeting their targeting there to to get it down to them yeah, and I tell you, it's it's funny now you say that because I felt as well against Kerry watching the game. There was a half a yard either side away from actually creating three or four more goal chances without a shadow of a doubt because of their press. And 
so I actually go back a number of years ago. I remember playing against Dublin a number of years ago, and from a coaching perspective, you know, people were quizzing and why do they keep going along when they lose it? But in, in fact, in that game in particular, I remember it very clearly. It was four or five breaks a half a yard away from creating clear goal scoring chances because they went to the three banks of zonal press, four, four, four. You're literally, and as you say, you can do so much, you can put it where you want to put it. But it's up to the players as well, the time, their, the time coming onto the break. And obviously as well, the right personnel coming onto the break and the right guys making the decision. Like So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on the Kerry one, without a shadow of a doubt. Like, but I thought, and this probably leads me on to the next one now for yourself, Like, and this question that, that, that uh, Kieran and a few of the boys wanted to ask you was, is is the long is long kick out now the new short? You know, is it is it more beneficial now in Gaelic football, even at club level now, to go long rather than short? Because I suppose people are going to be looking, thinking, well, if we go short and we lose the ball, we have, we still have a hundred meters to work the ball up the field. Whereas if we go long and we've got a good trajectory in our kick out, and we lose the ball in the opposition's half, we still have ourselves set up and we're still reasonably well organised in the middle third to turn a team over. What what's your thoughts on that in general? I think I think the short kick had really come into play for a number of years there because teams were sort of dropping off a lot and even the zonal press was like say a three in the front line so it's easy to pick holes in it. Um, whereas now teams are pressing up uh, as you said the three banks of four, and there isn't much of a gap. But if if you can go over two of them banks of four, and you have only say six in there, you know that means that you have an eight v six at the other side of it, you know so. Like that's that was our sort of aim. If we can get the numbers to the break, um, and and get over as many of the other teams players, if we win the ball, we're setting up a, a great opportunity. Now it is grand if you've got a keeper, as you say, can sort of keep the trajectory right and still get it long. But if you're just smashing, you know, a kick out up into the sky and it's landing, you know, inside your own half, and it's it's giving the other team a chance to get bodies around it, then it it kind of defeats the purpose. Like, but. I always say, uh, like you have to be mixing it up. If you if you go short a few times, it forces our team to press up. Whenever they press up, that's your opportunity to get out the back. And likewise, if you go long a few times and they start sitting back off it, then you've got your your chances to go short again. So, mixing it up to me is the, the key side of things. And if you try to just go with with one of them, it's a it's just not going to work. You're going to be easily found out. Like there's there's keepers in every county I suppose that are great at, at picking pockets but if you press up on them can they can they go really long and likewise there, there's keepers at, at club level that have a really long kick out but you, you can nearly like I know in, in Tyrone there's times we've actually completely sat off teams and said them you can kick short if you want but they actually don't want to they'll just drive it out to where the numbers are for our team like which mm. so it's it's knowing the opposition and knowing what they're going to do I think is the key to it and, and then having your own ways of getting around it yeah, it's not it's not a one it's not a one size fits all approach. Like you get some some uh, club keepers be writing to me and saying like you know how do, how do I get more distance on the kick out? How do I get more accurate? You know, and then you get managers writing and asking like you know what would your advice be for setting up for kick outs? And you're going well, to both answers it's easy. You practice. You know if you're going to go a full press, you practice a full press. You're going to go man to man. You practice what it's like. You want to hit the, your kick out longer, go and practice hitting it longer. You want to hit it more accurate, go and set up smaller targets and practice kicking it more accurate. You know, and I think, you know, Stevie, you, you'll know, and Joe, you'll know yourself. Like, it's a, everybody wants a quick fix nowadays. Everybody wants, you know, right, uh, how do you do this and how do you do it right now? It's the same in school. You know, if children don't know something now, they just say, oh, forget about it. I'm not going to do it. You know, rather than, you know, putting in the time and effort to getting better. And I think that's why, county players are where they're at is because they're more determined and more resilient to actually, you know, take a look at themselves. Where am I, where are my deficiencies? How can I get better? And then do a uh, getting better at them. And, you know, as, as coaches, I suppose, then it's up to the, them to create an environment where it's, it's motivating and challenging enough to, to get the best out of players. And that's what has happened this year in Toronto with Joe and Collie and, Pete and Des, like the, the just scenario based training a lot of the time and it's it's really challenged our boys to to think about what they're doing rather than just, you know, putting them in a in an environment where it's like, you know, a three man weave or a long kick passing drill and you know, that's that's grand at the you know, at the very early start of the year in pre season where you're looking them to cover big distance by you know, with with the ball in their hand, but 
you have to be putting people in a scenario where it, it challenges them and uh, it makes them think about what they're doing. That's, that's a brilliant point you made there, actually, about the quick fix. And it's something, Joe, we've talked about before. You know, everybody looked on when Dublin were winning five or six in a row and they're all looking now at the, at the fancy stuff and the, the basketball-type formations and all these little lovely, sexy strategies they have. But really and truly, one of the key attributes of any successful team, and you, show, you guys showed it in abundance, and it's something that, look, I, I, I'm i probably one of the very few <laughs> that actually admire Tyrone, you know, from, from within our own province. I know there's there's not a lot of love for Tyrone in general in, in, in Ulster, but I have huge admiration, and i said this numerous times before, huge admiration for the intensity that you guys play football, and it's something like, even the Tyrone Club Championship is always a, it's always a championship that I would sit down and watch a couple of games, because the intensity of it is just fierce and anybody obviously you know from outside of of of, of Ulster should take a spin down and watch some Toronto club championship games but now this is something that I want to ask you about from an intensity point of view to sustain those levels of intensity surely to God the, the strength conditioning is just has to be at its at its optimum and I know Pete's in there and he's doing a fantastic job and it, it, you know obviously he's taking up a role as well with with Irish uh, rugby union, like, and that's that's just testament to his professionalism and his expertise. But surely that's not, as you say, a quick fix. Like, this has been something that has been obviously a journey that you guys have been on from a conditioning point of view. And I just want to ask, and if it's it was too close a question, like, as a buy-in perspective and as a group's perspective, is your S and C is it completely collective now, or is it individually based, or what is the situation? Is again, obviously, I don't want any secrets of the trade, but is it is it total buy-in as regards collective sessions? So we, like, the majority of our stuff this year has been done just on the pitch because, you know, mm. in terms of GAA um, guidelines, like they said, they only be collected three times. Like, and we were so rigid, like, and it, it was nearly unfortunate that we were the ones that caught, were caught with a, a huge outbreak of COVID because it was, it was nearly frustrating at times how rigid they would be with, you know, a... In terms of like, we just built a new gym in Gibraltar, which cost like I don't know how much a uh, half a million pound or whatever it was to to put this in. You know, it was an oversight whenever they built Gibraltar in the first place. Now they've got this state of the art gym, and I think I was in it maybe three times this year. Like, you know, so a lot of it's left. Obviously, Pete is sending out the sessions and um stuff in terms of gym, but it's a a lot of it's. You know, left yourself. You go and you get your own stuff, and go to your club gym if if you can get into it and whatever. But like the conditioning side of things is done on the pitch. Um, it's mixed into the training. Uh, again, like it's mm-hmm. it's doing scenario based stuff where it's just helter skelter, like and it's it's really testing boys and uh, it's testing them mentally at times more than it is physically in terms of like uh, who's gonna quit, like who's gonna drop out, like and. Pete's, Pete was unbelievable whenever we had him at the start. He left uh, last year, obviously, for a year. He went to Monaghan, but in that time, he'd, he'd really, you know, got into his Ulster job. And whenever he came back this year, it was like a completely different man. Like, you know, all our sessions are sent out in the morning. Like, so if we're training at half seven at night, we know at half eleven what we're doing that night, how long each drill, like each area is going to take who's taking each area, what we're looking to do in that area. And, you know, stuff like that's class because you're going to train that and you know already what you're doing. You're so tuned into what you're doing. If it's, like, there's nights where the goalkeepers are just for the keeper coach for the majority of it until, like, the last 15, 20 minutes. There's other nights where it was like, right, lads, we're doing kickouts from the start here. Uh, we're going to need you. Then you can go back to your goalkeeping coach while we're doing our uh, conditioning. And then you'll be back in for the, for the games at the end. But it, it was just, it's unbelievable and the the measurements that Pete does in terms of the the using the GPS stuff and he's just he's just so professional and it's we're like the the depth of gratitude that we owe him for what we've achieved. But it has been a journey, like the majority of our boys have been there, you know, for three, four, five years under Pete. Yes, what or or and we had Johnny Davison last year who was equally as professional, you know, and you know, you can see why the two of them were at the well Johnny was at the top of, of the game and you can see why Pete is now getting his rewards and in, in with Aaron Rugby Sevens. 
Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, Nal, you, you mentioned earlier, not keep you too long, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, about practice and um, we've got 500 coaches on, on the daily platform there um, and they're hungry for information. Uh, you, you said that, you know, that your dad coached you a lot when you were younger, growing up. How important is it to have someone like that, you know, at an early age to help with you, improving you and developing you? Uh, I, I can't speak enough about how important I think a, a, a role model is at home in terms of, of GA or somebody, you know, close to home or somebody that's willing to spend time to practice. Like, like daddy was a brickie. And uh, I can always like once he came in from work six o'clock, like and the man was probably rack tired. I would have had him tortured. Please come out the back. Please come out the back. And like our backyard was like mo it's mostly concrete. There was a wee small grass patch that he he got me a set of goalposts on whenever I was younger. But by the time I was six or seven, it wasn't big enough to even use. We just kicked up and down the driveway, like, and then he, he started to take my right shoe off. He wouldn't let me wear my right shoe to make me kick with my left foot and stuff like that. And then there was nights where he'd have, like, our yard doors, like a big, like, sort of, it's like tin nearly, like, it, it, it's not heavy, heavy metal. So he would have had me, like, catching the ball and giving the, I, I would have been giving the metal door a bit of a shoulder, like, acting the big man as you, as you do. Um, and they, uh, you know, he'd been kicking the ball up in the air, he'd been kicking it low, kicking to the side, make me run, take a solo, whatever. Um, and then, like, he was so influential in the club in terms of the youth youth training. Uh, he was one of the, the ones that set it up at the very start back in the, the early 90s. And mum would say that he used to take me up whenever I was in the baby carrier, like, and just set me on the steps and then go and take the youth training and just come back up and lift me, put me in the car and then away again. And then... Once I could walk, basically, he, whenever he took me up, it was just roam about the pitch. Like so, all I've ever known really is is in dark pitch, and it's just for now to be me, Darren, and Colin to be the first three from the club to win All Ireland. We didn't have any representatives in 03, 05, 08. It's just it's going to be so special going back this week. Um, we've trained on Friday night and in a club game on Sunday, and it's, I'm really, really looking forward to Sunday, like getting back out in front of people and them to see the three of us that have now got. All iron medals in our pockets representing the club is, is just unbelievable. We were chatting about that today now in school, actually. Uh, a lot I work with in school was saying, uh, I was telling him I was doing a wee pod with you tonight, and he says uh, he says it was some weekend for the Eden Dork club. He says that second goal was 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 made and finished in, in Eden Dork. So if, if only McKenna had been a part of Eden Dork there, it was a full collection. <laughs> yeah, we've we got him transferred there, so I'd say. It's, it's going to be we're going to be doing that in a regular occurrence now every Sunday in league football if anybody wants to go and watch what, yeah, what, what club's Connor again? what club's Connor? Aglis it begins with E like, so at least it's an e, a club that begins with E we can claim that right, right, right. very good very good well okay. here is, is the party is the party still going or, or is it or is the party over? Uh, well, the party's definitely over for me I, you know yourself I have two children <laughs> and, and on the uh, on Monday, Monday, so we had our banquet on Saturday night, and then Sunday evening we went out. Uh, we were out in Kalein, and then we went to uh, Galbley. And a few of the boys were going back to Pomeroy, and I says, "No, I'm I'm going home." Like so, got home at about two o'clock, and then of course morning feed at quarter past six. Like so, back to earth was an absolute bang. Like on on Monday, and I've I've been I'm at a different end of the the, the scale to a lot of the players, so. I've been taking it taking it easy most of the time. I've, I went went and met them every night, obviously, but no, definitely I'm I'm finished now. Like I'm hitting the hay. Once once the children are in bed tonight, I'm hitting the hay and hope, hoping to get a uh, at least twelve hours of sleep. Like if if none of them waking. <laughs> I toddlers toddlers and morning bees have no respect for all Adam medals. No respect. No, <laughs> none none. <laughs> they just don't get it. <laughs> brilliant boy. Here, thanks very much, boy. Brilliant boy. Brilliant. Thanks very much, now. Yeah. Not a bother at all. Not a bother at all. Okay, and thanks to our viewers for uh, for listening in, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Thank you.